Figure it out. Hello, this is Adam Korlick with Figure It Out Productions. The following video is part of our quick shoot series. Hey everybody, welcome to the I Think We Finally Have a Name for This Podcast, uh, starring myself, uh, Adam Korlick, and my co-star, Chip Sinkbell. Um, That's news to me. Yeah, no, I actually, all right, so you guys know that we've never had a title for this particular podcast, and we got a suggestion, and I thought it was pretty good, so I'm going to say it, and I want to see what you think, Chip. Okay. The Figure It Outcast. Yeah, I mean, it works for me. All right, Chip's an easy sell. So at least <laughs> this episode will be called the the, the Figure It Outcast. Uh, I like it because it combines it into an actual word, outcast. I don't know why. Uh, but, yeah, if you guys vote on it in the comments, tell us if you like the name Figure It Outcast, and uh, we'll go from there. So aside from that, what's going on, man? Like, uh, how have you been? Oh, you know you know that I've been busy with grad school, so that's been eating, well, I know, eating up my but time. they don't know. Yeah, well, you're the one that asked me what's going on, man. So, well, they're not all is... here to ask you, dude. <laughs> I have to ask you. Everybody wants to know what's up with Chip. Uh, yeah, I'm sure all all negative one people. No. Nope. Uh, so yeah, uh, I work full time, and I also go to grad school, and then I also do other stuff like art classes, which are separate from grad school. So I'm been pretty busy. Had a midterm in artificial intelligence uh, last week. Got the grade back uh, yesterday, and. Thanks to Adam's magic wand and hand waving, I got a good grade on it, which is nice. Yeah, I was happy to help with that. Yeah, yeah, it's appreciated. They said, you know, I had to slip them a couple of hundred thousand dollars underneath the table. No, no, I just made threatening calls. Don't. Oh, I see. It. Okay. Yeah. Well, anyway, so that went well. Uh, let's see. In terms of gaming, I got uh, the uh, GBA EverDrive thing. Yeah, uh, I have one of those. Yeah, and it's pretty I did a cool. video on one. Yes, you did. And I also got uh, the EverDrive for, uh, what is it? The uh, PC Engine Duo. It's basically the TurboGrafx one, but it works nice. for the PC Engine as well. And, yeah, there's uh, just a little switch on there. You can just switch between the two. Oh, okay. Uh, Did you I notice it? No, I there's haven't There's a little put switch it in on the board. It just uh, it says like TG16 or PCE. You just switch between the two. Okay. I haven't actually put, tried it yet because I've been waiting. Uh, uh, there's an interesting story behind this one. So I, I ordered the, the GBA EverDrive and the uh, TurboGrafx EverDrive at the same time. And uh, so I got this, you know, you get like 14 emails. I got it through a Stone Age Gamer, so 14 emails from them. And the first one was like a pre-processing saying, hey, here's what, here's your receipt for what you wanted to order. You'll send you another one when the process, you know, goes through. It should only take like, an, you know, less than an hour. And I, you know, I didn't really pay, pay attention. And then, and then later I got another email and I said, okay, you know, here's the, the charge. And then it dropped my Turbo Graphics charge. So it just had me bi being billed for the uh, GBA EverDrive. There's a note on it saying uh, back ordered. So I was like, okay, maybe the Turbo Graphics was back ordered, and it'll you know you get charged once they actually have one, and the other one was was not back ordered. Um, but I looked at my bank statement, and I was actually charged for both. So about a week later, and you know, I'd already, or maybe a couple weeks later, I got the GBA EverDrive. You know, was tr trying it out. I'm like, man, why have I haven't gotten like a shipping notice or anything like that for the Turbo, the Turbo Graphics one? So I Send them an email and immediately they responded saying, "Yeah, there's a glitch in our system. Uh, we see that you've actually paid for both, but apparently we only got sent uh, a request for one of them, so we're sending you the other one." And uh, so they actually, at the time when they did that, they said, "Oh, we're also out of manuals because I gotten like uh, this complete thing with a manual and a little box and stuff." And uh, so they're sending that separately. So I'm waiting to actually pull out the uh, the uh, Turbo Graphics EverDrive once the manual gets here, so I can put that in. Nice. But, uh, so there you go. There's a little story behind my experience. I mean, customer service is great with them. Apparently they had a software glitch, which is the first time I've ever had a uh, uh, a glitch with uh, making a purchase. Then again, I typically just use Amazon for everything, so I guess that's mm -hmm. why. Yeah. Well, Stone Age Gamer, those guys are really nice. Like I know a few of them personally. Uh, the people who run that place, they're they're good dudes. Yeah, um, yeah. They, at least their their service seems pretty good, so that's mm -hmm. nice. And if you guys ever want to see a video on the TG16 EverDrive, I did that one too. You can hey, check that out. So plug I got in the you, videos. I got you, yeah, I got you covered, man. That Good, way you can go I can and get you can, confused. You can just watch yeah, them. well, if you're sitting, because you didn't even know it supported the PC Engine and the TurboGrafx 16. Well, I knew that it did. Know. I didn't know there was a switch. See, so. you would have known if you'd watched the video. That's true. Yeah. See, I'm trying to teach you things, man. There you go, folks. Anyway, uh, with me, uh, just been another busy month of doing the rounds. I've been, to, I think it was in San Francisco, like three times this month. Uh, I was down in Texas with you. That was fun. We hung yep. out. Ate a lot of food. Uh, yeah, we did. We had food. We talked about that already, but 
in the previous episode, but still, it was fun. Um, and actually, by the time most people hear this podcast, I will have gone to San Francisco again and Dallas again. Just so you know. So, um, are you ever just going control. to, I don't know, live in Chicago again? I'm trying. Uh, uh-huh. that's, I'm, that's what I'm doing right now for the next day or so. Oh. <laughs> then I'm off. Oh, goodness. Yeah. You mean one of those right. nomads. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, but unfortunately, you can't actually bring the nomad. It's too big. But, oh, um, but I'm... Yeah. Psh- hey Okay, but yeah, that's that's basically been going on with us. Uh, We're having a good time. And now we're going to talk about some upcoming things. So uh, by the time the all right, so the Patreon backers who uh, will see this uh, or get this right away, uh, you'll be having a Black Friday event coming up soon. And if you're seeing this in the public version, Black Friday is likely, I think, already happened. So I just want to talk a little bit about Black Friday. First of all, Chip, do you do anything with Black Friday? Do you care? Uh, let's see. Really all that I've done, uh, one time a long time ago, I stood outside of a Best Buy to get something, and I've already forgotten what it was. Some video game or something that was going to be on sale for Black Friday. Uh, but most of the time, I just go to Amazon or some other website like Target, and they tend to have deals that are digital, you know, online retail deals at the mm-hmm. same time. And leading up to it as well, like Amazon is, still has deals. You can just look up Black Friday for Amazon, they already have them going on. They're pre-Black Friday deals, which is kind of weird. Yeah, the Black Friday has become a month-long holiday. Yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's insane. But uh, are you going to do anything with this year, do you think? Uh, you know, I'll probably just browse through Amazon occasionally when I remember, just to see what the deals they've got each day of Black Friday month, I guess. And mm-hmm. uh, there's also, like a, what is it, Cyber Monday? Yes, yeah, I've never after. found anything good on Cyber Monday. Yeah, I've never actually looked to see what's supposed to be on cyber monday so uh really uh, you know unless i find something that's really interesting that I, i'll get online but i have too much stuff anyway i need to get rid of it i noticed yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh but yeah black friday man like every year i like i really look forward to black friday because that's a really good day to get a lot of like the you know game releases that came out over the like the last year but like massively marked down especially if you go to places like best buy where you have like gamers club unlocked on top of that you can save, like, a shit ton of money. So at the time I'm recording this, I have no current plans. There's nothing specifically on my list. But, you know, a lot of the, um, like, guides and stuff don't come out until, like, a week or two before Black Friday. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what happened. Or if you're watching this when the public release happened, I think and hope it went successfully. Um, yeah. But we'll see. Uh, I used to get, like, a lot of consoles and stuff around then, but uh, as of now, I don't know if there's going to be any deals on any. So hopefully there will be, or slash have been, because that would be great. Uh, But as far as games go, there's a few on my list that I would like to see massive cuts in. But uh, we'll see. Hopefully that works out. Give me an example Uh, of one. I would really like to get uh, the Bioshock collection for the PS4. Mm, Okay. Um, I could get it right now, you know. Uh, for like forty eight bucks at Best Buy, but I'd I'd rather wait and see if they have any sort of like insane like twenty dollar deal or something like that. I think you're welcome. Uh, thank you. Yeah, exactly. So th- I'm not in a rush. I I try not to to buy new gen stuff all that often unless uh, it's around now or at least around uh, Black Friday because a lot of it gets massively discounted around then. Especially all like the big releases because there's all these big releases that come out in like October, November, December. So a lot of them compete with each other, and in doing so, they they massively drop a lot of the prices with each other. So like I can't. I mean, this is just an example, but you know, Titanfall Two might be like a, a thirty dollar game on Black Friday for all we know because it's just got to compete with so many other things. It's very but, true. Yeah. So we'll see. Like that. There there is a large precedent for that, and I know Microsoft especially. Uh, does insane deals with their first party stuff like Recore will probably be like a ten dollar game if I had to guess. Um, so stuff like that. So we'll see. We'll see what I can find. I'm excited, but currently no no specific plans. Well, it's and, still a little ways <laughs> out anyway, right? Like when is well, Friday, November twenty fifth? Yeah, but uh, if this is if you're listening to this on the public release, then it's already happened. But yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. But yeah, for exactly. us when we're recording, it's like it's almost a month away. Yeah, exactly. So you have to remember that. <laughs> but yeah, so I'm, I'm excited and uh, hopefully we get something cool. Uh, now, the next, this kind of led me into thinking uh, about Thanksgiving, because of course Thanksgiving is the day before Black Friday, which is where all this crap starts. And I started thinking, like, why isn't there a Thanksgiving simulator game? 
I don't know. I don't know what came into my mind, but I was just thinking like I want to. You've ever seen like Surgeon Simulator? Yep. I would just want to see a game where you have to play as a guy who's just like he's got to eat everything on that table, and but like you know his stomach can't handle it. And I don't know exactly how the game would work, but like you just got to eat everything. Like this big fat slob has to eat every single thing on the table. It's Why doesn't that of, game uh, exist? You ever heard of a game called Enviro Bear Two Thousand? I have not. Uh, I don't know if there's actually a physical release. It might be one of those digital only PC games, but mm-hmm. essentially you're a bear in a car, trying to eat enough before you hibernate for winter, right? Nice. So you drive around getting fish and berries and fighting off bees and badgers, trying <laughs> to uh, basically eat enough before winter comes and you have to drive into your cave. So, yeah, let's, let's, let's put a little spin on it. Instead of just you know, sitting at a table, you are driving in your car trying to run into people's Thanksgiving uh, picnics and whatever, and you're trying to get their food to eat for Thanksgiving. So that would be cool, and then you can combine it with Black Friday, because you have to eat enough to have enough energy to get through Black Friday. That's right, exactly. Yeah, and there's also time limits, because, you know, your family's coming, so you got to finish before they get there, or before they leave, or whatever the rules are. I'm just saying, there's potential in a Thanksgiving simulator to be that stupid game that everybody buys and then regrets, like, a month later. Like, your goat simulator type of thing. <laughs> Thanksgiving simulator, I'm telling you. Let's That's do right. it. Let's, you're a programmer, make it happen. It's already happened. Okay, I just good. made it five I'm seconds glad. ago. I'm glad. That was efficient. You're good. I know. All right, but anyway, I don't know why I thought of that, but I wanted to talk about that. <laughs> okay, well, I'm so, glad I'm glad that crossed your mind. Now, the, probably the first smart subject uh, comes from a Patreon backer named uh, Corey Marsh. He asked uh, a particular question um, because he's at that Patreon level. He gets to choose a subject for us, and he wanted to know if the success of the Xbox One and the or Xbox One S and the impending Scorpio has Sony shifting their tactics in any particular way that we see as obvious. Um, so like, basically, does it seem like Sony is responding to the fact that the Xbox One S, I'm not sure if you're aware of this chip, has outsold the PS4, uh, every month since it has been released? Yeah, I think I saw something about that. And basically, you know, how do we think Sony is reacting? Um, okay, so at the time we're recording this, the PS4 Pro has not launched. It's going to be interesting to see how that response so what we say might be massively out of date by the end of november because we don't know they might crush it in november but uh i i i think chip you mentioned this in an earlier podcast stuff like that they have to plan like massively in advance so odds are sony hasn't done much of anything to respond to this yet will they yeah i would imagine they're going to do some holiday bundles or something but like besides that i don't know what else they could really do in this short span of time yeah, I mean, no company ever goes into a conference having, you know, to show off their hardware, having known our hardware is inferior to this other company's hardware that they unveiled, you know, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so, you know, especially when, when Sony unveiled the, the PS4 Pro and it was uh, weaker than the Scorpio and it actually didn't really offer, like they kept saying 4K, but it can't actually do 4K or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, they can't even do 4K Blu-ray, unlike the Xbox One S, which already exactly, exists. Yeah. Exactly. So, so I mean, they're releasing this PS4 Pro. They announced it, and, then, uh, and they're going to release it. And it can't even compete with the, the, the Xbox One S, you know, let alone the Scorpio. So, To be fair, you are talking about in media functions. In game functions, it'll probably be a different thing. I just want to yeah. clear that up for the people in the comments. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but, yeah, so that, that's true. Um, but overall, you know, they especially, they can't, unless they've made their system pluggable, which as these things get more computer PC-like that can, you know, be more easily done, you can't just swap out, you know, oh, let's just, you know, put in better hardware now. And, you know, you have all these deals arranged with manufacturers. You have uh, all the assembly lines already producing these things way out in advance. Um, you have just the, the, the royalties that have to go to different uh companies that own patents for different parts of the hardware you're putting together, all that kind of stuff. You can't change that that quickly. So I, I imagine, you know, Sony is probably sweating considering how it's basically a 180 from what it was when the PS4 and the Xbox One were originally announced, where, you know, yeah. the PS4 was, was basically crushing the Xbox One, uh, uh, at least in terms of performance is a bit better, and then, you know, everyone's opinion was much better as well. Um, and now it's completely flipped, where basically everyone's like, yep, yeah, Xbox One S and Scorpio are, are crushing the PS4, and we'll see how the PS4 Pro hand, uh, fares, but I don't think it's going to do that well, to be honest. Um, especially with all of the 
media info about the PS4. I mean, the only thing that could save it is consumers being you know blind and and not really not really looking at the specs or just kind of buying into the 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 Sony uh, press releases instead of actually looking to see okay how's this console do for, compared to the other one. The only thing to me that could really save it would just be you know if there are exclusives on one console um, mm-hmm. that make you want to get that console, which. Sony, I'm sure, has a variety of JRPGs that will appear on its console. Uh, so if, maybe if you're an RPG fan, you might still go get the PS4 or PS4 Pro when that comes out instead of the Xbox One. But if you're getting multi-plats, I'm assuming the Xbox One S or especially the Scorpio down the line it might be a better choice. Um, there's also the PS4 VR. Um, yeah. Which, is that out yet? I can't remember. Yeah, yeah it is. It's it. actually yeah. doing really well. Yeah, so, so there have been discussions about, you know, is the PS4 VR going to be a fad or is it actually going to help the company, you know, months forward? And I don't, I, I've not been following it, so I don't really know what, what the general consensus of the of the VR is. So obviously it sounds like it's doing well in terms of sales, um, but obviously, you know, the, the technology is only going to be as popular as the games that sell it, right? So... Mm-hmm. If you don't have a good string of games to continually come out for the VR that can actually you know, continually improve on top of the VR technology and, and make better use of it, if, if, if they hit a, if they hit a uh, a plateau where they can't you know they can't get any better performance out of it, they can't really do anything more unique, uh, or you know Microsoft comes out with some sort of VR. Is Microsoft coming out with VR for the Xbox One stuff? Is that Hololens thing they're still doing? Is that uh, well, happening? The, Hol, Hololens is, is is AR, so it's different. Um, that, as far as I know, that's the last time I heard about Microsoft doing anything with VR or AR. Yeah, I haven't heard so, about any sort of headset from them. So that is that is a plus for for Sony, right? If you want VR and you just want to buy something that comes, you know, all works together, and you don't want to buy a giant gaming PC to support VR, um, or you're not even a gaming PC, just a PC with a enough graphics card to actually run it because keep in mind when you run vr you need to hook it up to your pc there's no standalone headset that just works you know you put it on and boom vr it's got to hook up to something mm-hmm. like the htc vive and the oculus rift i think all have to be tethered to a pc yes but um so it's it's different because you actually have vr through a console which how does it compare to oculus rift and uh htc vive and there's like gear vr and other things i don't know mm-hmm. um i imagine uh, especially with the the Vive and maybe the Oculus as they move forward, they'll be able to outperform the PS4 VR. But uh, I think it really depends on what kind of game library Sony can get for that PS4 VR. And if people actually continue to find VR interesting or if they just kind of say, oh, yeah, that's interesting, but I really just want a controller and a screen in front of me instead. Yeah, I'm with you. PS VR, it seems to be doing well, although the general consensus on it is not surprising. It's that it's more convenient to use and obviously a lot cheaper but the capabilities are nowhere near as good as say the vive but you trade that for a substantially cheaper and easier to use device yep yep and for a lot of gamers you know that aren't pc gamers and then maybe that's what they that's all mm-hmm. they want right they just want you know let me just hook put put this in my living room put on the headset or whatever the the psvr stuff is and just go right mm-hmm. uh versus the people like i have uh, some friends at work that have the vive and uh, and the Oculus Rift because we we do some experiments in our lab on on that stuff just to see how viable it is, um, but uh, they definitely like the Vive more than the than the Rift at the moment. Um, uh, the Vive, uh, I think the Rift is getting this or has this already now. But the Vive has actual controllers you can use to like for your hands. So you get you get hand control instead of just being a visor you wear. And uh, so games like uh, there's a PC game called Tabletop Simulator, where you can play a variety of card games and other stuff. Uh, has Vive support, so you can actually use your hands to move around the pieces, which is a lot more fine-grained control than using a mouse and trying to move things around in a 3D space, which can be a little clunky at times. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I'd say, uh, you know, the PC platform definitely has probably higher-end VR and uh, obviously can, you know, has a much easier time just growing, so you can just, you know, new, new iterations of the hardware, uh, new requirements for the minimum specs of the hardware, whereas PSVR is basically stuck to essentially the ps4 hardware yeah uh, which is going to get older and older as you go along supposedly the pro will help with that but we'll see i I don't know that firsthand yeah the specs Um, that they showed for the pro did not look like it can do that much more than the ps4 we'll talk about that in a minute but before we do i want to circle back around to the original question on why we think the xbox one s has been outperforming etc 
Um, we have to also remember, I'm just going to play devil's advocate here. I think part of it is the fact that the Xbox One S was a huge improvement over the original version of the Xbox One. Uh, with a lot of new features, it was also a lot cheaper. It takes up a lot of space, or a lot less space. Um, as where, but when Sony released a slim version of their console, they really didn't do anything to improve it. And if anything, I think they actually removed the optical audio output, so it actually has less features than the original version. Yeah, it's less features, um, but people did say they like the slim's look and feel better. That's yeah, but I mean, the, isn't that kind of pointless? Because it was only like two and two months later, which is now November. Uh, and we got the Pro, so there was really no point in buying a Slim. Yeah, um, it actually feels it, like Sega, you know, when yeah. they just kept throwing hardware out. You know, yeah. here's the, what was it, the, I'm already blanking out now, the 32X. Oh, wait, yeah. here's the here's the Saturn or whatever it came next, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, it, basically, what I'm saying is I think there's a possibility there were a lot of people who either already had a PS4 or they were just on the fence, and then they thought, oh, okay, I guess I can get an Xbox One now, they're cheaper, it does more, blah, blah, blah. Um, I'm not going to say that I think the everyone suddenly shifted and decided that Microsoft is the way to go this generation. I think it's too soon to know that, if that's how people are responding. We don't have enough information yet, because when we're recording this, the Pro hasn't launched. We really won't have a greater sense of this until, I would say, maybe January or February to see how all these platforms did over the holidays. But my guess is the reason Xbox One S did so much better than PS4 is because PS4 hasn't really offered anything new in the last few months, whereas Xbox One S is new, aside from the PS4 Slim, which, as we discussed, doesn't really change anything. Yeah, and to Your be honest, the, mar- the marketing behind the PS4 Slim versus the Xbox One S, the Xbox One S I actually saw some marketing for. Mm-hmm. I've not really seen anything for the PS4 Slim other than just the press announcement, which is also very faint, right? It's like, oh, here's this thing, and now the you know, PS4 Pro potentially as well, you know. Uh, so it feels like they didn't really push it that much. They kind of just already gave up on... The slim mm-hmm. before it even got out the door, right? Yeah, there's, it was. I mean, again, it's totally pointless because of the of the PS4 Pro. Which actually, uh, thank you to Corey for that subject. I guess we'll move on to the next one because this is a perfect segue. The question is: the PS4 Pro. Are you getting one? Do you have any interest in it? What do you think? What do you uh, think of the PS4 Pro? Uh, I mean, it's not worse than the original PS4, which is a good thing. Um, I don't own a PS4. Nor do I own a PS4 Slim. Nor do I own actually an Xbox One or Xbox One S. I only, of I guess the current generation of consoles, is the Wii U even considered in that generation? It is. It's. It, okay. I mean, people argue both the graphics aren't as good. And it's like no, that's not the point. But uh, yeah. it is a current system technically, even though it's about to go out the door. But that's a different subject. Yeah. But yeah, so the Wii, the Wii U is what I actually play a little bit anyway. You know, it's a party system when I have friends over, that kind of stuff, and it has some interesting library, uh, interesting library of games as well. Um, the PS4 Pro and just the PS4 library in general have not really uh, the RPGs that come out these days are not really the ones I want to play and I'm a big RPG fan I find myself just going back to classic or older RPGs than the, the newer ones because a lot of them have more of the cutesy anime style characters instead of anything gritty or serious and I'm sure there's some games out there that would be the diamonds in the rough for me on the PS4 or PS4 Pro but I never really had anything to really drive me to get to that console, since most of the titles I'd play, I can just play on the PC, you know, cheap price on Steam when it goes on sale a while down the road, right? So uh, I've not really had an incentive to get one, and the PS4 Pro with its specs and everything else does not really make me want to spend money to get it either. Mm-hmm. Um, aside from the, the whole idea of the concept of upgrading consoles, which is, is new... Uh, if we just accept that fact and move on to whether or not we want one of these things, I want a PS4 Pro, but not in the same way I've wanted new consoles. Because uh, the PS4 Pro, I can't really utilize the way it's intended. Like, it's uh, presumably will have some sort of 4K display. Whether or not games are rendered in 4K is very unlikely, but it will have some sort of 4K output. I don't have a 4K television, so I can't really take advantage of it that way. The best it would do for me is whatever games I already own that developers choose to patch to upgrade, presumably I'll get better visuals out of those games, but we're talking about a minute uh, upgrade here. Um, so I'm not, I'm not like you know busting down Best Buy's door to try and get one of these things. But one thing that actually uh, somebody pointed out about the PS4 Pro that actually has me really excited is if you look at the uh, the PS4 versus the PS4 Pro, the PS4 has two USB ports in front and none in the back, 
where the PS4 Pro has two in the front and then one in the back. And a lot of people thought that was kind of strange. And one guy said, you know, I'll bet that's four, is I bet Sony's going to finally accept that they have to add external hard drive support. But maybe they'll limit ah. it to, yeah, but they might limit it to just PS4 Pros for whatever reason. If just that's wait. they'll come out with a proprietary hard drive, just like they have the proprietary Ugh. SD cards. It is a USB port, so hopefully that's not the case. When did <laughs> Sony use prop- Oh, yeah, you're thinking about the Vita. Um, yeah, it's basically just a glorified SD card that's proprietary. I, I hope Sony. Same Sony's- with the, same wait, with the PSP. It had that as well, though. Yeah, I just hope Sony's not dumb enough to think that a proprietary hard drive in the back would be a good idea. But I'll tell you this right now: if the PS4 Pro supports external hard drive support, done. I'm getting it immediately. Uh, I I need that shit um, because I have a bunch of PS4 games. You can't fit them all on the console, and I'm just I don't like the idea of having to constantly reinstall shit. Uh, mm-hmm. I want that. Sh- I just want it done. I want it preserved and ready to go. Uh, so even with a one terabyte drive in there, it's you know it's beyond full, and I hate that. So mm-hmm. if they ever add external storage, I'm gonna be really excited because I've been saying this for years that external storage is like the one thing that would really make me switch over to the xbox one s this generation mm-hmm. uh or at least maybe the scorpio we'll see um as a, for my console of choice you know what i'm saying mm-hmm. so i really hope it has that uh but i guess we don't know that at least at the time we make this um but we don't know about the idea that uh, it'll have it natively i think a lot of people are speculating it would just be a software upgrade why that wouldn't work on a standard ps4 i don't know and i would hope they add that as well but maybe that's one of those things they'll do just to try and incentivize people to get a PS4 Pro. Yeah, it definitely could be. I mean, marketing decisions in corporate companies, uh, not marketing, this decisions in general in corporate companies always, you know, always follow the money. That's where they go. Mm-hmm. And you got to, yeah, I'm just worried about them doing too many dumb things because uh, Sony is pretty much entirely reliant on the PlayStation brand right now. And as we just talked before about, you know, like, they're, it's not doing as well right now as it, it has been. Microsoft is beating them, at least in the past few months. And if they get too arrogant and too dumb and they make too many bad decisions, they could they could do some damage to themselves. I mean, PS4 Pro, if you were asking me, like, if, if I was going into the PS4 Pro, what it should be, you'd have to accept that Sony doesn't really have the kind of money to lose on, like, 4K gaming-capable consoles. Like, the Scorpio is not a product that Sony can make. Microsoft can afford to make that. They can afford to tank uh, on a product. They do that all the time. But with uh, Sony can't do that. So that's why, no doubt, the PS4 Pro is a lot more uh, affordable, basically. Uh, Cost-effective, I guess would be a better term. So if you're asking me like what that sh- what it should have been able to do out of, the, out of the gate, it should have been able to have backwards compatibility with PS1, PS2, and PS3. Like, I know PS3 would be more complicated, but it's not impossible, especially if you're going in and upgrading all the hardware. You just want, because, I mean, Microsoft's giving you free backwards compatibility now with the 360. And, again, rumors are coming up about Phil Spencer, again, talking about original Xbox backwards compatibility. I mean, that's that's one of those things, man, where it just helps drive people over, even if it's just something you can just market it with. Imagine all the PlayStation people being like, dude, yes, one box, done. I mean, oh, yeah, that- we, we had this discussion before about, you know, uh, in, in a different light about, you know, I think, it, I can't remember if it was Corey or someone else asked about, you know, should you get... Uh, a console for each region or can you just you know get one for all of them it's like we hands down we're saying you know one console so it's the same thing applies here if you can get one console to play all of your games for like mm-hmm. multiple different generations of games of course that's 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 fantastic yeah that's what i would have told sony with this thing is with the since you are going to go the route of upgrading your hardware which is unprecedented uh with the exception of like the the new 3ds or whatever uh, you had an opportunity there to add a lot of features that people have been wanting for years. And if they don't do any of them, then w- really, what did you even do? Uh, you just made your console less anemic. That's all you did. And that's going to, at best, work for them for like a year until the Scorpio gets here. So it's going to be an interesting year to see. It seems like it almost feels like the PS4 Pro is like a band-aid measure to kind of hold them over for another year cuz they don't really know why they were that successful and they don't know how to maintain it. That's what it feels like. I'm not saying that's true, it's just what it feels like. Yeah, that or a sign of arrogance back, you know, when they're like, "Oh, oh yeah, know, we're we're back on top again. Uh, the PS4 is crushing the Xbox One in our eyes." Mm-hmm. And by the time, you know, they'd made all these calls to do research and like, "Oh, let's put this something, you know, here's a slim and then here's the PS4 Pro and know, just do these things then by the time they got to that point of actually releasing it, they were behind, right? Oh, that's uh, so true. So yeah. 
it could have been one of those mistakes where, whoops, they didn't really think they had to do that much because they were already ahead. And then they got surpassed and they didn't do enough, right? That, I, I really would love to get into, like, the head of somebody who works at these companies, like the, the major ones. When they get to that point of being arrogant and they just decide to screw everything up. Yeah, it's just, always money, though. It's always it money. Always they, is. Yeah. It's always it's, it's always sad when, when a company, you know, is too big. Well, this actually happens when companies get too big. They get too big mm-hmm. to sustain the size that they are. So they rely on certain divisions to you know, make the money to pay for everything else. Similar to how Google got actually when yeah. they started uh, trimming down and making a lot of uh, tight cuts here and there, especially when Af- uh, Alphabet came about. But you kind of see that where you can see that, you know, they go where the money goes, but they also have to, you know, they start trimming off, doing layoffs in certain areas. I mean, IBM has this happen all the time mm-hmm. um, just to, to help manage stuff. I'm just wondering if Sony is too big right now. They need to shrink down or really it's almost like the PlayStation department needs to split off, right? And I wonder yeah. if, if it split off, you know, even if it's not doing as well as it was earlier, if it would make, uh, if it would be, you know, stay afloat a lot more easily. Yeah, it's hard to say, man. Sony's got so many problems. I mean, they, they kind of did what you're talking about a couple of years ago and were consolidating. I mean, that was when they were in the losing position. That's when they start making smart choices. And now Microsoft is in that position. So with Phil Spencer at the helm, they started making a lot of smart choices. And I'm telling you guys, everybody listening, Every generation, this always happens, and the guys who uh, are losing will almost always offer you the best game console, because what they'll typically do is they'll give you the best deals, they'll give you the best games, because they try the hardest to make the games and the, the experience great for you, whereas the guys at the top, they just enjoy being at the top. I swear it happens every single time. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. I mean, it's hard to say from our point of view, since you know neither you nor I, Adam, have had crazy success where we're just right on the top of something, right? Yeah, um, we both try pretty hard at what we do. Uh, I, I imagine you know if we suddenly had like incredible success when we didn't expect it, it, it might it might affect our actions a bit, you know, in terms oh, of I'm how sure. we do things too. Yeah, that's another reason when you're in those positions, it's good to get some outside, you know, fresh blood basically telling you maybe you shouldn't do that. Exactly. But, yeah, yeah, it's it's hard to say. it's easier said than done, I guess. Yep. Um, but all right, I think we're good on that subject. Uh, moving on, I want to give a quick shout out here to a guy named Colin. He is a Patreon backer and he's at the tier uh, for a shout out. So thank you, Colin, for helping to make this podcast possible. Um, thank and, you, Colin. Yeah, Colin, you the bo- you the man, man. <laughs> uh, you the boy. You you're my the boy, boy, Colin. You my boy, Colin. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I'm sorry, Colin. He's so offended now. I can tell. Um, but yeah, no, moving on, we have, uh, another subject here. This one comes from, uh, Kyle, uh, Kyle Vaughn, and he, uh, again, picked a subject, uh, cause he is at that level and he asks, uh, what our stance is on remasters and re-releases for this generation, things like the Bioshock collection, the good, the bad, and the, uh, et cetera. And I think basically what he's asking is like, how do we feel about, the idea that a lot of seventh gen games are being re-released this generation and called like definitive edition and getting all these collections together. I'm going to let you go first on that. Oh, I was actually going to defer to you on that one. Oh, uh, really? Any particular I reason? actually have only heard of a couple of them, including the Bioshock one, right? So uh, I'm actually right, well, not that you, knowledgeable on this. So you, you go what do first. You think, well, what do you think in principle of it? In principle... Um, I mean, I could go first if you really want me to, but I, I, I just thought, you know. You can All right. Well, in, in principle, I think one advantage of having a have having like a, a seventh was it seventh gen going to eighth gen? What which generation yeah. are we on? We are on uh, currently on the eighth gen. Okay, uh, seventh going to eighth, right? If at some point there was DLC that was released and, and they did not have like a game of the year edition or something like that, and this definitive edition bundles that in, and I'm mm-hmm. not talking like a digital download. I'm saying like it actually bundles in the disc. That's a plus, because that means you can actually get the full game with all the content on a physical release, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if that's the case for any of the any of these releases. There's a lot uh, of them that have that, yeah. Yeah, uh, so so that's a, that's an advantage. Um, uh, another reason would be uh, if you really like uh, the current console, and, and like we've said, you know, PS4 can't play PS3 games. Um, so if it's for the if it's for the PS4. And then there's a plus because it means you don't have to keep your PS3 around if that was really one of the only games that's keeping you keeping a PS3 around, right? If you only had some of those games that are being re-released, it's like, okay, you can literally drop your PS3 and have a PS4. Now, is that the case for me? No, I mean, I have a lot of RPGs on the PS3 and I've not really seen the equivalents on the PS4. Um, and like you said, Adam, the Xbox One uh, is getting backwards compatibility with uh, with Xbox 360, so uh, probably not as important uh, for them. Um 
One of the downsides, of course, is it could just be trying to milk uh, for more money, right? They know which, which games were really popular. Uh, just trying to you know, port it to the new platform um, when it's just another console uh, may not be the most uh, exciting, but I mean, you had this, to me, it's the same as if you have a multi-plat where you have the, the game that was originally on one platform ported over to another. It's just you know, a newer, genera newer console generation. Now, if they do things like add HD, in quotes, HD, a lot of times they'll say they add HD and it's not really that good, um, but if they actually did make it look a lot better or do some pretty nice improvements, that's another bonus. Um, although some people like to play the games with the nostalgia, uh, so maybe you like to keep the old one around. But overall, I think it can be positive. Uh, whether the games that have been coming out give the positive vibe, or if they just feel like they're a, a, a cash grab, um, is another story. I think they can easily uh, go into a cash grab kind of scenario. And to be honest, a lot of times, you know, I own the game for one system, I probably won't get it for another one, so I don't know if I'd really be one of those people that would get the, uh, the re-release, -re right? But, um... Uh, some games, you know, it may come came bundled with everything. Maybe, maybe I do it. But uh, those are my thoughts there. Yeah. So I, I'm gonna have to basically agree with you. And I know it's not really the popular position. I think we're both gonna take the unpopular route here. Uh, I agree with the idea that basically definitive editions are kind of a, a force for good, uh, is the way I see them. Like, all right. So hear me out, because I know a lot of people don't like them in concept. Because, like you said, they think of them as like you know milking a franchise or milking the fans, etc. A cash grab, all that stuff. And they definitely um, can be, right? We're not they, saying they, they can't be. They can be, but I'm gonna put this out there first and foremost. You're not required to buy them. There's Absolutely. no law that says you have to buy those collections when they come out again. That's a hundred percent your choice. Uh, and that's what it all comes down to. It gives you the choice to get this game that maybe you liked originally. Now they've improved it in some ways, and it's available for not only you, but for tons of people that never had access to it or never got it originally. It comes with, you know, it's like perhaps most likely the fully complete version with all the bugs or as patched as it ever got. Perhaps has all the DLC on it, like you mentioned. Um, often it can be a good deal, like the Bioshock collection specifically. You get all three of the games plus all their DLC uh, in one disc, uh, which I think is great. Uh, and, I mean, uh, you know, the, you, they make improvements to the game. They can upgrade a lot of the textures and they do all that stuff all over again. So that's awesome. It's also great for a lot of people who, you know, uh, we'll use some PS4 examples like Last of Us. Uh, when that originally got announced for the, the PS4, a lot of people were, like, upset. They're like, dude, it was like this big PS3 game. Everybody played it. Why would you do that? It's like, well, everyone had a PS3 played it. But the, a lot of the people who bought PS4s were Xbox 360 owners. They never had the option, so now they do. Um, and it's not like this is a new thing. I mean, this is b games being re-released like a generation after goes back a long time, like a long time. Like you know, th that that's happened constantly throughout gaming history. So th there's not, it's not really new. I think the reason that we're seeing it, uh, that it feels newer, is that it happens a tad more frequently now, or at least. Um, seventh gen games are re-released and marketed as if they're brand new releases like Skyrim Special Edition is marketed almost like it's a brand new release when really it's not it's the same game with some enhancements uh, at least for console purposes uh, one thing I can tell you talking to a lot of these like developers at these companies is that they all kind of tell you the same thing like they're these are focused for console gamers not PC gamers so like Skyrim, for example, the re-release they did is not more advanced than the PC version, especially when you uh, factor like uh, graphic mods and texture mods into it. But it is better for anybody who only ever played it on console, and that's generally what they focus on. So I'm I'm defending those actions. I think it's it's better for gamers in general to have more options. One could argue against it by saying it limits creativity and all that stuff because they just keep re-releasing the same stuff. I, I get that, but you have to remember the other thing, like these companies are in it to make money and those games were really expensive to produce. And so if they can put a little bit extra into it and then get like another bite out of the apple, they're going to do that. And it's if you hate them, don't buy them. But there's a lot of people who just want to have them. And this is a good way to do that. Sounds good to me. All right, then. Uh, so <laughs> any other before, thoughts? Before we go, before we go to something else, uh, this actually reminded me. It's a complete tangent, but hey, bonus, bonus, bonus content, right? Woo! Um, so there is one game that was re-released uh, that actually they changed the mechanics of the game. Oh. Um, 
which was very odd to me. So I can't remember the full name of the game. Uh, it was a PlayStation game originally. It was one of those that I used to rent from Movie Gallery back back when. Um, called Rhapsody, I think. It was basically uh, a turn-based uh, tactical uh, JRPG, similar to kind of Final Fantasy Tactics, back when everyone was trying to make a Final Fantasy Tactics clone. Um, so it was, it was, you know, you were on a grid, you moved characters around, you fought that way. You had all these puppets and other stuff you could kind of use. Had a weird soundtrack about pump, uh, pancakes and stuff. I don't know. It was weird. Um, <laughs> but they re-released it. I'm trying to remember if they released it on like a the 3DS or their, or something. They released it on something. And they changed it from being a turn-based, uh, you know, tactical JRPG, like with the, on a grid, to being like one of those traditional uh, RPGs where, you know, your, your, your characters are facing... The enemy. So you just see the enemy on the screen and you just kind of point to one of them and fight them that way. So they changed it entirely from being a grid-based RPG to like a turn-based, like, standard old-school RPG where you just look at something and you fight it, right? Um, which is a pretty big change. So in that case, I did not like that re-release because I'm a big fan of tactical RPGs. Mm -hmm. And uh, they changed the mechanics of the game to a completely different audience, I guess, because it was not a, a turn-based tactical RPG anymore. I'll tell you that that is an issue you can present, is that some of these upgrades are not actually upgrades. A lot of them uh, fall flat. Um, like, for example, I think my favorite example is when they re-released Silent Hill 2 and 3, uh, which were originally... the Silent Hill 2 was on the PS2 and the original Xbox. Silent Hill 3 was just on the PS2. And uh, people wanted those as like an HD collection, so they did it for the PS3 and they did it for the 360. But the team that did the port... I guess wasn't really very good at this and they also didn't really have access to the final builds of the game they had access to like beta builds of the game uh so they basically had to go in and try and work with the beta builds so ultimately what came of that was incomplete buggy versions of the game for the hd collection um huh. it's actually highly regarded as like one of the worst hd ports of all time uh, and it's it's even the guy who may, who's like the director of the first of those two games basically condemned it publicly, saying like don't play it. If anybody who ever plays this is going to think these games are just terrible. Like uh, one thing, all right. So I don't know if you've ever played those Silent Hill games, but one yep. thing that oh you have okay. So yep. in the Silent Hill games, there's like this persistent fog everywhere, right? And it's, mm -hmm. it, it kind of keeps you in this like creepy mood, right? But in the HD collections, they patched it out. What? They patched out like, oh yeah, this like fogs in the way. So that was iconic. I know, and it's it doesn't exist apparently in the HD collections, uh, because either this is because it was an old build or because they honestly thought. I heard that it was also that they honestly thought that was just like a bad visual, so they wanted to get rid of it. Well, wow. uh, some of the characters, uh, who who was the there was a woman in the second game. I forget her name, uh, but at some point apparently in one of the builds, she like turns blue. Uh, like just completely <laughs> okay. like the color blue, like they, they completely screwed it up. Um, and yeah, so sometimes bad stuff happens there, but in, it would have been nice, honestly, to have a functional operational Silent Hill HD collection. That would have been great because, uh, Silent Hill three is still locked to the PS2 and the reality is what it is. The PS2 doesn't look very good. It's games don't clean up very well on the PlayStation two hardware. Even so it would have been composite. nice. I mean, what? it's a shame. It's like even when you use composite, they still don't clean Component, up boy. Component. This man <laughs> uses composite for everything, and he owns a frame meister. He's a monster. Yeah. Um, this actually reminds me of one more example. I had yes. totally forgotten about it. Another port that, at least for me, did not seem to go very well. I think the consensus was it wasn't that great either. There's a port to the PS3 of uh, Eco and Shadow of the Colossus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, when I had tried playing the Eco version... When I had moved my character around, literally it would become very blurry around my character. Um, mm -hmm. Like, very distorted. So, I don't know if I had a bad disc or, or what, but it definitely was uh, a step down. I actually couldn't play it because it, it was hurting my eyes to w look at the character as I was moving it. Hmm. Um, which is very odd. So. I'm unfamiliar with that particular issue, so I can't comment. But, yeah, so that's, so that's definitely downsides when they get screwed up. But that's, that's also, again, reliant on the developer screwing it up. When the developer does it right... I don't really see a negative to it. And once, a lot of the time, because um, like I said, a lot of these guys focus on these being console upgrades because they want to do it for console players. But in an effort not to leave PC gamers out of this, a lot of those collections, they'll just do free upgrades if you already have the PC version. So like Bioshock uh, 1 specifically and Skyrim, again, as examples. If you already had them on Steam and you've had them since they were released, 
uh, they just released a public, you know, like a free update to the game that is the HD collection. So it just upgrades the version you already had with all the texture improvements they did. And they don't charge you anything for it if you already owned it. So, like, again, I just, I don't see that much of a negative in it unless they botch the port. Um, I, like anybody else, would love to see, you know, more unique and original titles. And one can argue that they're taking resources away from that by having developers focus on allocating resources to porting these things over but i mean that's so much more limited than it would be to just build an entirely new game uh there does come a point where we're to get out of control like if literally every game sony put out was just ps3 games running in like 1080p then yeah that would be problematic but that's that's not really the case Mm -hmm. so any other thoughts on this no no i think we've exhausted this one all right thank you kyle uh, so now we'll move on to uh, another subject that uh, I'm going to credit you with, even though I don't think it was actually yours, but I'm going to credit with you. With it. None, none of these were mine, so there you go. I was trying to be nice. None of these were chips. <laughs> I was um, lazy this month. He was. But uh, I, this, all right, so the, the subject, of course, is the Nintendo Switch. Uh, now that's, for those listening who somehow don't know this, it's uh, the Nintendo NX is now the Nintendo Switch. It will be their next console. Comes out in March 2017. I did a video on my thoughts on it already, so this is going to be all chip. Oh, good. What everyone wants, right, is all chip and no atom. Yeah. Uh, and by that, I mean not not once. No, it's completely go. true. Like, I mean, I've considered changing my name to Dale just so that this podcast makes oh, more sense. Oh, my goodness. And now the jokes come out, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, it took a while. How many episodes? <laughs> this is like Are you kidding me? You've had the chip in and all that kind of stuff following me around yeah, forever. Yeah, never chip and Dale. Oh, goodness. Um... Okay, so Nintendo Switch. Uh, so I'd actually say that with the last generation, uh, or I guess the current generation, because I don't, I guess the Nintendo Switch is supposed to be next generation. Uh, that's highly, highly, highly debatable. debatable. If we just go like, by the fa- if we just right. go by order of consoles, right. if, if they're releasing new consoles, is that is that new generation? Let me phrase it this way. Um, from a technical standpoint, we believe it will be inferior to the original version of the Xbox One. So to say that it would be ninth gen based on its hardware alone is impossible. Mm-hmm. To say it might be based it on timing is uh, one could have that argument, except that it's going to be sandwiched in between the PS4 Pro and Scorpio, which are definitively not ninth gen consoles. Well, the, the Scorpio is also arguably, you know, it's the same architecture, and they're trying to get rid of the whole generation thing by having it. Yeah, I'll play on everything, but. Scorpio's hardware is a pretty big bump up, right? It is. It's going to be substantial. And that's yeah. my point. Uh, you can't have this thing that comes out that's inferior to the stuff that's already out from a technical standpoint and have it be the next generation. It doesn't generally work that way. Generations are hard to define because they're like one part technology, one part timing. Yeah, I was about to say, here we go. We're getting into a debate on what a generation is. We're not going to do that. <laughs> we don't make those rules. We just kind of learn yeah. them. Um, yeah, I mean, in my head, my ge- a generation to me is just, you know, okay. The companies that are involved in this, they released a game console. When they when the companies release another game console, it's the next generation. Not including See, that's not the. Even, but that's not even fair either, because like there are companies that do two in the same generation. Atari did that. SNK did that most recently. So like, oh yeah, I know it's not fair, but that's just how my brain typically works, right? It oh, I know. Lumps, that's, lumps those together. Everyone has rules like that, but the problem is they don't really work. They're all kind of a, a fusion of all those rules. In fact, I, I might actually have a generation per company. It might just be, oh, what's the company's next game console? That's their generation. Mm-hmm. That's their next generation. And the generations don't actually line up together. Well, that see, even makes sense. I'm, I'm, I mean, we don't know enough yet, but I'm still of the mindset that this is just going to be a really odd generation. Eight, generation 8 is going to essentially have six consoles in it. Yeah. Uh, two from Sony, two from Microsoft, and two from Nintendo. Well, it works for me as long as... As long as we keep getting interesting stuff, which is, is where I'm kind of going with the, with the Switch. Yes, I apologize. Go ahead. <laughs> I actually think it's interesting. Um, I'm not... I can't say I'm, like, ecstatic about it, but I'm definitely more interested than I've been in pretty much any game console since the Wii. Uh, the Wii U, not the Wii. The... Um, yeah, I know you don't like the Wii. I was going to say, oh, yeah, since the Wii, I'm so excited. <laughs> well, to be fair, when the Wii came out, you know, before I actually knew what the motion controls were like, I was actually pretty excited about that one, too. Yeah, I know. I have to admit um, I was, too. I thought it would be awesome. I had the and... run with it. My experience wasn't terrible because I typically just plug in a GameCube controller or something else whenever the game was compatible, right? So a lot of the games I played would support some sort of controller because they knew that the motion controls really detracted from the game itself. Um, 
But uh, for the for the Nintendo Switch, I found the I found the the uh, what is it? It's not a trailer. What is it? What, what is it? Like there? Uh, that, just that video. <laughs> that video. That video where they have like all these. Well, so one interesting thing was, did you notice how in that video there were no kids? Yes. And there were no like there's no one older than like maybe maybe in their thirties. You know. Dude, yeah, they they aimed that at people in our age bracket. That was yeah. smart. Yeah, which, which, yeah, I agree. It was very smart because what they think they realized is, okay, we dropped the ball. With the Wii, we hit all the people that weren't normally gamers, right? Mm -hmm. With the Wii U, we tried to kind of dig our way out, but we didn't do a good enough job with marketing or anything else, so we fell on our face. With the, with this, with the Switch, we've got to target the audience that would potentially be getting the system. Because to me, children are probably not going to get the Switch unless their parents just get them this console because they're wealthy. Um, they're gonna have. They might have a, a 3DS or something like that. Cause that's where I, I still see kids occasionally, uh, at least in in Austin, with 3DSs, right? Um, but uh, I feel like the yeah the market for this one, at least the prime market. You know, there's so many people of all ages getting this thing, but the prime market is our generation for this one. And, but I did find it very funny the video, because uh, just the way that they, you know, like any any marketing video, they're trying to be hip and cool. It's like. Why play basketball when we can play basketball on the Nintendo Switch? You know, uh, like why play it in real life when we can just sit down and, and play it with the Switch? Um, which is kind of amusing. And, you know, it's like, let me take my Nintendo Switch with me to this party on a rooftop uh, and then let everyone else see the Nintendo Switch. <laughs> the, the, mm -hmm. the, what they were showing was pretty funny. I, I laughed a bit at it. Um, I agree. It was very implausible, but I got what they were going for. Yeah, I got and, and it was interesting because they actually showed a variety of features and ways to use the system. You know, they showed, okay, you know, take the screen, put the controllers on either side, and you have a handheld controller um, or handheld system, right? Uh, t take the screen off. You can actually have the, the, the controls separately. So if you just need to put the screen, you know, set it somewhere a little further away so you're not just holding it close to your face and have the controls separately, you can do that, which is pretty cool. Um, they have it where, okay, you can you put the, the whole console with the screen and stuff in this weird U-shaped bin that holds it, and then, boom, you got it on a television. Um and the fact that you can take off the controls, uh, and, and it probably depends on the game, but when they had the basketball game, uh, you know, each person grabbed half of the controller, or I guess one of the little Switch things, uh, whatever they're actually going to call them. I actually don't know if they have a name. The little side, you. Yeah. you know, one, one joystick and like two buttons, which makes you think of the nunchuck kind of from the Wii. Uh, that kind of thing, and each person took one and played with it. It's interesting the different uh, applications of the Switch just from that video, right? So already it's, it's pretty versatile in the ways it can be used. Now, I think, you know, how easy is it for games to leverage those different mediums? Are they going to lock it saying, you must play this game with both of the uh, parts of this controller? Or you must play this game and it must have uh, the controller pieces against the screen. Like, I don't know if they require... What parts are going to be mandatory and which parts are going to be optional entirely? Where there might be some games where you can't play it in some of the ways they advertised, right? Especially yeah. when each person can have like half the controller to use to play games. I'm assuming it's going to be a fairly unlimited, but maybe more party games, maybe more very simplistic games where you only need one joystick and a couple buttons mm -hmm. right, to play it. But overall, I'm excited for it just because I still feel like Nintendo actually makes something that feels like a game console, which is interesting because... The PS4, PS4 Pro, Xbox One, Xbox One S, they definitely just feel like, you know, as they get closer to PCs, they just feel like a PC. And they're like, well, I, just, I own one of those. It's what I do my, some of my work on as well. I might as well just play games on that, right? Um, the Switch feels like a, a more fun, uh, vibrant way to bring video games back to people that want to play them, right? Um, not quite sure about what kind of games would be on there, except for some of the launch things they've just been discussing, but I like Mario and I like Legend of Zelda games, and I like a lot of the, uh, the Nintendo first party games, so I'm sure it'll be a fun console if it, just for those, but I do hope they'll get some third party support, uh, because obviously if it's just Nintendo doing first party again, they're going to be in a, a world of trouble. Yeah. Though I will, I'll call this right now, back, going a little throwback to this whole re release thing. The Switch is going to have a ton of Wii U re releases. Holy mm -hmm. shit. Like, even mm -hmm. from that trailer alone, we know that Mario Kart is going to be one of them. Uh, we know, I mean, granted, the next Zelda game is going to be on there, and that'll be new, but it will have been on the Wii U already, technically. 
Yep. Um, it was developed originally for the Wii U, uh, and I would assume we're just going to see a bunch of them. I mean, we know Splatoon's going over there. I'm, I'm betting you that Nintendo's going to take a lot of their most successful Wii U titles and throw them all over onto the NX. Uh, or, sorry, <laughs> the NX. The Switch. Uh, yeah. In an effort to kind of, you know, buy themselves more time to develop more stuff. We also know we're getting that new Mario game. Yep, although, yep. you know, who knows? Maybe that game has been in development for the Wii U for years. Nintendo is incredibly secretive about stuff like that. And maybe then they realize, okay, there's no point in making a Wii U version of this. We don't know that. Yeah, um, I mean, that's happened with Nintendo games in the past, too. They've developed it for one system, and then by the time it's about to get there, they scrapped it and took parts of it into a new system, right? Like... What was it? They were going to have Star Fox 2 on the Super Nintendo, and then that yeah. got scrapped, and parts of that and parts of other games became Star Fox 64. Mm -hmm. So that's definitely possible. Um, I do think it's good to bring the Wii U library forward, uh, yeah. more than, say, bringing the PS3 library forward to the PS4, or the Xbox 360 library forward to the, to the Xbox One, if they're even doing that with them having backwards compatibility, maybe not. But uh, the, the Switch... I think already has gotten more attention in media outlets in general than the Wii U had, right? Um, yeah, I that kind of sounds familiar. I mean, I remember when Wii U was announced, nobody really gave a shit. I mean, I still have people where I bring it up and they're like, oh, Nintendo still makes game consoles? Yeah. And I'm like, oh, uh, uh, yeah, they do. That's what this giant gamepad with the screen on it is. And they're like, oh, I thought that was just like an Android tablet. And I was like, uh, no. So uh, I think... Uh, the fact that their audience was so small for the Wii U, mm -hmm. bringing those libraries to the Switch, there's a much better chance than, say, the PS4 or the Xbox One of of people not having played those those games. So it yeah. being as if those games are written for the Nintendo Switch, which is good because that means, you know, if you get swamped with a lot of existing titles that were on a different platform, even an older one, uh, it, it hurts because people are like, why would I buy your system? I have the old one right now. I'll just wait until you get something interesting, right? In fact, that's what I hear a lot. People say, I'm waiting to get this system uh, once some games that I'm interested in come out. Now, with Nintendo, if they get some good first-party games that are only for the Switch, you know, if the if the, uh, if the the Mario game is only for the Switch, if they have some other uh, games that come out. Cause I think, uh, is Breath of the Wild, that Legend of Zelda game, is that for Switch only or is that for the Wii, Wii U well? and Switch? Wii U, okay. So, so if they have some games that are Switch only, I think that'll be good. You know, mix those in with some games being brought forward, and maybe as they go along, if they can keep adding a couple of new game, first-party games and bring in some uh, games in the Wii U and kind of be a, be a balance, I think they'll be perfect. Because I think they'll they'll for most people that did not have a Wii U, they'll have a huge library of games. But then for people that did have a Wii U, they'll still have a reason to keep getting new games on the Switch. Yeah, I, I kind of I agree with you, and I also think in a weird way that the failure of the Wii U might be one of those things that actually helps the Switch. Um, to use an example here, uh, when... All right, so in North America, Sega, the Genesis, it was massively popular, right? And uh, then... But the Saturn was not. You know, nobody really had a Saturn. And I, I've said this before, my own experience. When the Dreamcast was announced, uh, I was like, oh, shit, Sega's back, you know? Because the last console I'd had from them was the Genesis... And I hadn't even heard of the Saturn. Like, nobody really had heard of the Saturn in North America. It was just such a, it was a disaster here. Um, and I'm kind of thinking that for a lot of people, not, you know, not all of us, mostly, frankly, the majority of us listening to this, uh, I'm sure you guys all know what a Wii U is. But to the m mass audience, I'm sure a lot of them, the last Nintendo console they remember is the Wii. Uh, and to them, Nintendo's just kind of been silent for a few years. And now the new Nintendo is finally here. And yep. it, as a result, it might be quite successful. Um, hopefully, it works out better for Nintendo than it did for Sega in the long run. But yeah, we uh, don't want that. Repeat, yeah, you get my point, though. But yeah. a lot of people are saying if the Switch does fail, though, that that might be Nintendo's last chance at a hardware. Uh, yeah, it it might be. I mean, to be fair, I mean, uh, it's interesting because I still can't tell if this is going to replace the 3DS. If they're going to eventually fade out the 3DS line. And just have one console to focus on. I'm right? sure they don't even know that. Yeah, My guess is uh, they're waiting to see how well it does and how right. Yeah, like if everybody well who buys does. one. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, no, go ahead. I was gonna say it, it depends on how not only how well it sells, but I'm sure they'll have you know research into how much people are actually using it as a portable as opposed to just a docked console. Like that's what I'm gonna do with it when I get one. I have no intention of using it as a handheld. I don't care. But, yeah, uh, I might actually use it for a handheld because I use the. I have an NVIDIA Shield that I still use to play PC games on my couch. Mm -hmm. uh, not even on the big screen, just because I usually 
I'm like uh, sideways on my couch because my dog likes to sit on my lap. Yeah. There, so uh, that's uh, that's a little appealing. Although I'm sure a lot of times it'll just sit docked somewhere, just like the Wii U is. Because I could also do the do that with some games on the Wii U. I could just take the game and and display it entirely on the gamepad there, right? Mm-hmm. And I don't use that feature that often. Um, yeah. Uh, I was going to say something. I forgot what it was now. Quick, stall for time, Adam. <laughs> well, I was going to actually bring up a couple of the switch points. Um, I was thinking, how do you think patches are going to work on this thing? How big do you think cartridges might be? Or the, they're not really cartridges, but you know what I'm talking about. The little carts they've got. I'm uh, kind in, of in terms thinking, of uh, space? Like yeah. Size? What I'm, I'm kind of guessing there's not going to be a standard size for these things, and they'll just kind of have... A series of options, you know, like maybe a 32 gigabyte one, a 64 gigabyte one, 128, etc. Like whatever the game requires, with enough space left over that patches can be downloaded directly to the cards. What do you think? So that's interesting. Um, and, and remind me when we're done, because I'll probably forget. Uh, another coworker of mine, he's about 40, was actually explaining some advantages so that I had not considered at the time for uh, cartridges versus. Uh, the disc disc media, right? Well, um, you're talking getting, about like load times and install times. I'm no, guessing. No, no, no. A completely uh, they're a little different. I actually ran into some of those when I was playing on the GBA uh, EverDrive too. Mm-hmm. Anyway, uh, in terms of patches and downloading directly to the cart and the cart sizes, uh, in terms of uh, you know gigabytes of space or however whatever the size they have on there, um, I do think it will. Uh, one advantage, yeah, is that they can have you know if a game needs to have more space, they can do that. Um, they've done it in the past. I think they did that with the uh, Super Nintendo and the 64. And 64, that was pretty common. Yeah, where they had ranges. I think Majora's Mask actually even required an upgrade to some sort of processor or something. You had a, you, it came bundled with some like thing you'd swap out or I can't remember now. No, um, I think you're thinking of Donkey Kong 64 with the uh, the the RAM cart. Yeah, there's some sort of cart, but I thought Majora's Mask came with one as well. No. Not that I'm. It might take advantage of that card, but I don't remember it ever coming with one. Because I never owned the Donkey Kong game, but I know I had to replace something in my 64. Yeah, it was probably the RAM card with like you took out the regular jump pack and then replaced it with the uh, the red one, the expansion pack. Yeah, from, from the console itself, not the controller, right? It, it goes in yeah, the console. Yeah. 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 yeah so it was, it was the RAM pack, but I don't. I never owned the Donkey Kong game, so. On well, 64. that wasn't the only game it came with. I don't know if it ever came with that with Legend of Zelda, but uh, it's possible. But okay. I, I think it was just one of those games that utilized it. But there were some games that utilized it and some games that required it. Maybe it did. I honestly don't remember. Yeah, I feel like it I feel like it did, but maybe it doesn't. I it's been so long I don't remember. But I got off track. Now I forgot what I was gonna say again. Uh you were talking about cart size, downloading updates, etc. Yeah, so the downloading updates, um I could see them doing that. Uh it'd be nice to not have to uh one, that would be incredibly wonderful because if you want to take your game over to a friend's place uh, it wouldn't like you to bring, bring over your whole console with the updates on it, right? Yeah. Um, in fact, uh, one of my friends brought over his Wii U when I was having a French toast party uh, because uh, he had a digital version of, uh, like, or some, like a lot of updates for uh, uh, Super Smash Brothers on the Wii U. And he's like, it'll take hours to download all these things again. So I'm just going to bring over my whole Wii U to do it. But if he could have just brought the game... And just plug that into mine, you know, that would have been fantastic. But obviously, a disc you can't really do that. Yeah. Um. So that's that's a huge plus. I uh, uh, having the patches on the cart itself. Um. I'm trying to think of uh, other advantages of that kind of stuff. Uh. But before I forget, uh, so one of my coworkers brought up. It may not be as relevant to. Uh, a home console, although this one is also portable, but you get additional interesting features when you don't have a disc as your medium. So when you have a cartridge, uh, a lot of people just think, okay, there's just memory in there, right? You can add a lot more more things to it than just memory. Um, You can add coprocessors to it to do additional work on the uh, cartridge itself. You can add sensors, which is actually something I ran into. I was playing a Game Boy Advance uh, game on the EverDrive. I'm forgetting what the name of it is. But it's something to do with like the sun. It's like some sort of sun warrior, not golden Golden's, sun. Not golden not go- sun. Okay. Not golden sun. It's not an RPG actually. Well, actually, it's like a. That's like an action RPG. You're basically a vampire hunter, and you're supposed to use sunlight on the Game Boy Advance cartridge to charge your gun, and it also changes the look of the game. So if it's, so if it's sunny, it'll actually make it brighter, and if it's not sunny, it'll make it cloudy in the game. Um, which that's cool. Is, it was cool, 
but it sucked because the EverDrive does not have a sun sensor that I'm aware of. So, I can't imagine it would. So I basically ran around with having no energy, just trying to find these little scraps of energy without utilizing the sun. <laughs> I don't know how you do that on the EverDrive. That may be one of those games that just isn't fully playable. Yeah, um, that's probably the case, yeah. Uh, but it's still a really neat idea. So the idea, you know, like I said, home console maybe not as maybe not as handy, although I could see some things, right? Especially you can add additional sensors that could potentially read new peripherals uh, for the system. Uh, if you want to have like a equivalent to like a light gun that actually has, uh, you know, more fine-grained controls instead of just using a Wiimote or something like that, uh, which I don't even know if the Wiimote's compatible with this thing. Obviously, you got the little Switch stuff. I hope I. They, I would assume no. I think they yeah. want to get the hell away from that. I, I think so too, um, which is good. I think I think it's good they finally dropped that because I think the Wiimote uh, added some baggage that they realized they didn't want to carry anymore. Um, yeah. I think it was smart that they carried over the Wiimotes into the Wii U, but obviously the market was not big enough to draw people into the system. Um, but yeah, uh, you can add a lot of more, a lot more things than just RAM or you know basically memory storage into those carts, uh, which opens up the possibilities for games on the Switch to have interesting, wacky features. Heck, you can even add things like if, if, if Nintendo ever added VR to their Switch console, you could have some interesting ways to track the carts that want to support VR and uh, you know, help the, the VR system know where you are relative to the cart or something like that, right? It'd be pretty interesting what they can do with it. And uh, obviously mobile, you know, if you want to support things like the sun on a mobile game that you took on the on the Switch, that'd be interesting, but I imagine the Switch is still going to be focused on home console that you can take with you, not this game is designed to be on, uh, you know, portable to begin with, which is kind of what that Sun uh, sensor-based game was meant to be, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm definitely excited for it. I think uh, it'll be interesting. The controller looks fine. It's funny to see people already, like, make a, some sort of dog mascot for it. it has the derpy eyes, you know, to, yeah, yeah. that looks like the console and or the, the main part of it. Um, I have heard some people say, oh, it doesn't look like a traditional uh, Nintendo console. I can't remember if you said that or someone else said it. It doesn't look like a, tr a traditional... I said it doesn't. I said it looks like a military laptop. Yeah, yeah. So it looks it looks like a military laptop. When you look at the main, like the, the, the dock where you put the actual system. But the handheld itself, especially when you take the pieces off of it, it looks a little derpy. And I'm like, oh, yeah, it's a, it's a little like Nintendo. I'm, I'm kind of... <laughs> it's, it's not fully a, a military laptop. Um but yeah, I, I think it's one that I'm actually getting a little excited into, but I, I'm still one of the people that gets the system for the games. Uh, so it's got to have some games that actually draw me to it. I think the Legend of Zelda game will, uh, but obviously that's also for the Wii U. Um, but maybe some of their future games will draw me in as well. I know a lot of my uh, co-workers, um, you know, ra age range between uh, 22, 23, all the way up to 39, one has turned 40. Uh, they're all, all of them are excited for the Nintendo Switch. They're actually going to get one as soon as it comes out. Although I do think the price point to be very careful with, because if they charge too much for it, they'll push away out of people that are considering it. Right? Yeah. I'm still thinking it's going to be 400. A lot of people are like, I better, it better not be more than 300. I'm yeah. not saying I am excited to pay 400. I just think that's what they're going to charge. Yeah. I mean, there were rumors already saying 399, 399. So if they drop down to 299. Uh, keep in mind, Nintendo has never had a console sell at a loss, right? They've had one sell at cost, and they've had a lot of them sell where they get a little bit of profit. But I don't think they've ever sold one at a loss, right? Yeah, no, they try to make profit on all the hardware. It's it, That's not their model, because it's, when you fail at doing that, then you really lose money, like the original PS3 did. The only way the sell console at a loss model works is if the games absolutely crush it. And yep. if they had done that with like the Wii U, they'd be in really bad shape. Oh, yeah. Which is pretty smart on their part. So they're they're taking less risk just by guaranteeing that they can recoup or, or not or not lose right when they're yeah. uh, selling a high unit high volume. Um, yeah, so so definitely interested. That's where I stand. So I have one final thought on the switch, and then I think I guess we'll wrap it up at that point. So my last thought on the switch here is I've seen a couple people point this out. Um, so the switch could have a lot of great games on it that work really well on a television. Or it can have a lot of really great games on it that work well as on a handheld. But will they work vice versa? Like, one thing that a lot of people speculate as to why the PSP and the Vita didn't work well is because they had a lot of these, like, AAA games that would work great on a TV, but they were only on this, like, portable device. And people didn't really want to do that. They wanted to play, like, games you can just kind of quickly jump in and out of, uh, which doesn't really work. Um, so are you going to have games like that where people are like, I don't... 
want to play stuff like this on the go and then never really use the portable feature or are they going to have a lot of portable centric games that are kind of annoying to try and play on a television yep just yep <laughs> just yep that's, that's i mean that's i i think i think they're going to have i think it's going to be television centric still um i i think i think they're going to have some games that try to go one way or the other you know uh i think they're going to have some games that are going to be really annoying to play unless you're doing it portable Mm-hmm. Um, but I think uh, I think they're most going to be television based, um, just because that dock is going to probably be used by a lot of people. Uh, but I could be wrong. I think it's going. I think actually, what's going to ch- what's going to dictate this? I mean, Nintendo's going to make their own games, right? They're going to have their own games that try to take advantage of Switch in different ways, just to try to show how it can be used. Um, but it's going to be up to the developers outside Nintendo that really. Uh, push the console in different directions. Um, and if a developer decides we want to make a game that's really utilizing the Switch to go outdoors and play the Switch, you know, uh, then that game will be centered that way. I think if they make games that are more targeted towards a portable uh, d- style and, and go beyond, you know, oh, just play the game you know, on the screen, which is a 720p screen, right? I think. Yes, 720p uh, screen. Which, uh, I mean, eh, doesn't bother me that much. I use composite anyway. Um, <laughs> yeah, you're uh, gonna go out of your way to try and hook up the switch through composite. It doesn't even support it, and you're gonna find a way. What? No composite? Every one of my systems goes through composite. I'm just guessing. And it goes like the the PS4 and Xbox One only have HDMI out. I would be astonished if Nintendo put composite ports on this thing. Hey, you never know. Maybe they'll put RF on there too. Yeah, for uh, good measure. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think there'll be problems if they make some games that are too heavily uh, portable because then people that just want to play on uh, their television won't be able to do that, right? Whereas mm-hmm. if you do it where games play heavily on the television, portable won't be as big of an issue, although you might have problems where text is too small to read on a small screen, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so I feel like it's going to lean towards being a home console, not a portable console, but I think it's dict- dictated by the developers themselves, yeah. right? Absolutely. Like, I mean, they showed Skyrim. Now, with, uh, side note, Bethesda has not actually confirmed that Skyrim is coming to the Switch, by the way. Um, but aside from that, let's assume it happens. Would you really want to play that game on a handheld? I know at first glance, it's like, yeah, of course, I wouldn't want to play, you know, run around with have Skyrim with you. But really? <laughs> like, how many situations are you going to be in where you have the kind of time to sit there on a portable device and play something as complicated as Skyrim? Well, believe it or not, I actually played uh, not Skyrim, but I played Fallout on a portable. I played on Which my one? Nvidia, Nvidia Shield. I played Fallout uh, uh, Four, the newest one. And how was that experience? I was fine. Uh, you know, sometimes the, I'd be a bit slow trying to turn around instead of using a mouse and keyboard. Uh, but that's the same you'd have on a console. So when I was playing it with on, on a handheld versus the PC, it actually wasn't too bad, but uh, it did feel a little clunky. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not sold on that concept, but, you know, I'm not everybody. So I think it depends on the game. It. I just think there's something to that, the idea that people just don't want to play complicated big games on a portable device. They just, I don't know. I would want to play it on a cell phone, but but if you give me a controller that like with a screen on top, then, then maybe. Um, maybe. Well, uh, then I'm lazy. we'll revisit this subject in a few months once the Switch is out. You'll get one right away, and then we'll test it. It'll be great. Exactly, and it'll, yeah. I'll blow it up with composite. For sure. He'll go out of his way to find, like, HDMI to composite boxes. Oh, make sure. I'm sure when those exist. Oh, they do. People have asked me about them, like, why the hell would you do that? But and now you, know. now you know. To make it worse. That's right. Oh, well, wait, no, better. No. All right, with that, I'm going to say uh, adieu. I think, we, uh, I think we're good here. Uh, thank you, Chip, for joining me, as always, on what is now at least tentatively called Figure It Out Cast. Please vote in the comments. Let us know if you like that name or not. Do a straw uh, poll. Yeah, straw poll. All right. Well, thank you very much for listening, everybody. Uh, thank you to uh, Kyle, Colin, uh, Corey, and of course you, Chip. And, hey. Uh, yay. And uh, we'll see you all later. Bye, everybody. Bye.